and welcome to episode nine of First Round. I'm joined this week by Steve Raddick. Hello. Steve is the, why don't you tell him your, your official long I am, long title. Uh, yeah, it is a long title. I'm the uh, Vice President and Director of Public Relations and Content Integration here at Brunner. Okay. And yes, we're not in my living room this week. We're actually at Brunner. We're actually in a nice little... Uh, Playing on the away field. Playing on the away field, yeah. <laughs> I, know. I feel like my skin should be burning a little bit after all the years of not working here. So, um, But I'm joined by Steve. It's a really cool spot over here at Brunner. And this week we are drinking another one of Sierra Nevada's beer camp. Um, and we're drinking Stout of the Union. I probably should have saved this one for right before the election, I guess. But, yeah. Um, so this is another one of the... You need many of them. Many, <laughs> many, many. You many. That close. So actually, that, that, that brings up something funny. I was out talking to my parents last weekend. Do you know that they you used to not be able to drink on election day? Oh, really? Yeah, they, they didn't Not stop. just your parents, everyone. Like, yeah, no, no, I'm pretty sure that they probably did anyhow, but uh, bars were closed on election day. I had no states. idea. Like, the idea being, like, they didn't want people to get all lit up and then go in and well, cast now, I don't even, you, you have to have, you're going to have to have the bars open. Yeah. That, that might be the busiest day of the, the year. The therapy for before, <laughs> yeah. before and after, so. Um, but we're drinking Stout of the Union. It is a, a, a one, another one of the collaboration beers that they're doing. Um, with a three or four, actually, it's five different beers. So, uh, Steve was asking about okay. this before we started. But the cool thing that Sierra Nevada does is they partner with... Um, smaller breweries around the country, so even more microbreweries to, you know, shoot or I'm sorry to create uh, different beers throughout the summer. So this is another one. So yeah, we'll give it a shot. It's good. Not bad. It's a little warmer. It's 95 degrees today, so yeah. it was the walk from the car in here warmed it up a little bit. So it's not the best yeah. way for a stout, but yeah, it's still no, pretty. Yeah, nothing cold. like a stout on a on a crisp on a, 95 degree day. I know the really funny. <laughs> th the, that's the funny thing. So like, I bought these. And I'm thinking, all right, these are beer camp. Like these are going to be like when I think of the word camp, I think of like summer. Yeah, sitting out on a bonfire. Yeah, most of these beers are all like super dark, stouts and heavy porters. stouts and porters. There's a couple lighter, fruitier ones yeah. like. That are more traditionally summer. This this is definitely not a summer beer, but I think I think we'll be all right. So um, I wanted to start. Steve Steve working at Brenner oversees a team and oversees the PR department here. And I wanted to ask a little bit because I think a lot of people that I that I've seen and are watching these these episodes are younger people that are you know if not fresh out of school, a couple years out of school. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit since you're in a position where you're actually hiring. Mm -hmm. You're making those decisions. You know, there's a lot of people who interview folks and talk to them and give them your two cents. But you, a lot of times, make that call. Yep. What are some of the things in the in the PR and social and content world that you work in that you're looking for people fresh out of school? I think, especially when you talk about fresh out of school, mm -hmm. the, the few things that I look for, and, and I think that I would say there's one big thing that I look for, and it's what makes you interesting. And and I think that's something that, that a lot of people, especially as they come out of school get so enamored with, you know, the best practices on the resume and, and what are the keywords that I need to hit that they forget that I'm still hiring a person, I'm not hiring a resume, and they forget what makes them interesting. Um, and I think that's what I, I look for, you know, first thing, that's that's the thing that's going to jump off at, at, at me. What, what's going to be different about your resume that you, did you study overseas? you know, for a semester, were you, you know, did you just pack up and move from your, you know, town in Kansas and, and pack up and move to New York for an internship um, just to try it? And, and even if you lasted a month, you know, and, and you got homesick and you went home, I don't care. That's interesting to me. You know, you, you took that risk and you went out there because if all you've done is played it safe, you know, then I have to wonder, you know, are you going to be able to take it to that next level that you have to when you come to the agency? Yeah, it says a lot about your personality if you're willing to take those risks. Or even if it's not a risk like moving somewhere or doing something like that, are you willing to, you know, what's one of the more interesting things you've seen somebody do in an interview or on a resume I, or a cover letter? Or yeah, I mean, I, I, there's been a number of ones. I had one um, woman that I interviewed and she uh, started an acapella group. Um, and I was like, that's that's really interesting. And so we ended up talking about like, well, why did why did you start an acapella group? Uh, you know, why didn't you just join one? Oh, well, there wasn't one. Okay, now I'm learning about her entrepreneurial skills and, and kind of how she takes initiative. She identifies a problem. So we walked through why she started that. Um, yeah. I had another woman who um, uh, was on. No, I had an, a, a guy that I interviewed was on Jeopardy. Um, he okay. was he was on College Jeopardy. Did he win? And uh, no. But he had a great story, and, and so that was really interesting. Why did you get on Jeopardy? What were your top subjects? And we, we talked about that. Um, and it wasn't even necessarily 
of the, you know anything applicable to the job that you're coming into. It was more about I want to know more about you. Um, I'm assuming as an entry level person that majored in PR, majored in communications, you've probably got you've written press releases, you, you write some social content, you've all basically got the same basic skill set. So I'm looking for something that sets people apart. Okay. I, I think that, that brings up a, a really good point about those life experiences because this is a field, this isn't a field that's purely training based at all. Like no. You can't really train. You can learn and get experience and get background on how to be successful in communications. But the training aspect of it, when it's something like advertising, you know, you have to come up with new ideas to market something mm -hmm. constantly. When it comes to PR, you have to find a different way to make a message stand out for every single client because if you know how to write a template of a press release and you learned that from one of the best schools in the country, well, guess what? You got graduated with 500 other kids who learned how to do the same yeah. thing and 20,000 other kids around the country who learned how to do something comparable. So to me, I like to hear what you were saying about life experience and different things because it showcases how people are going to think and approach things differently. Well, you mentioned press release, and, and I, I said this at, at Waynesburg. I gave a presentation down there last uh, year, and uh, in, in my presentation I said, you know, I, that's great that you can write a press release in AP style. Can you write a press release that anyone will actually read? And, and I think that was, that's a big mind switch for people. It's, I'm checking all the boxes. I'm writing everything that I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm taking all the classes I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm supposed to um, you know, take these positions. I'm, I'm this role in PRSSA. Um, and that's all great. And, and, but that just gets you in the door. You know, what, if, you're, if I'm going to hire you, I want to know what sets you apart. And can you write so that people like it? Can you, can you take a complex story and go beyond the best practices and, and take a chance and take a risk and, and write something that I'm actually going to be interested in? Because those rules about press releases don't really matter anymore. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, why are you going to read it? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, yeah, I, I was reading it, so last week, um, we're, we're filming this just after the Milan EpiPen oh, yeah. situation happened. And, I was watching a news story on it, so I actually went to Mylan's website to like find out how they actually handled it. And I clicked on it, and they had a press release as like one of their main things. And to me, you know, and this isn't a knock on Mylan in any way, shape, or form, but I read this press release, and the length of it was just so cumbersome. And it's not just Mylan that does this. There's so many people who feel this need that a press release becomes a you know an all-encompassing way of getting a message across. Yeah. And well, if it's in the press release, we cover it. Oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, if it's if it's in the seventh paragraph of your press release, you didn't cover right. it because even the media aren't reading the seventh paragraph nope. of your press release. So it's like this weird, weird thing that's happening where the press release is never. It's never going to die. I've had this debate with people. It's never going to die. There's always going yep. to be an important aspect of it when you release news. Um, you know, especially when it comes to finance and hiring and firing and all those things. But what's going to change about it is how much information you can actually distill from. Right. And whether or not it just becomes something that's an expanded tweet, basically. Well, it's, it's fragmentation, right? I mean, you've got so many other ways to tell that story and to convey the information in the press release that you don't need a reporter to pick it up and, and tell that story for you. You can do it yourself now. So, yeah, I agree. I don't think the press release is ever going to die, but I think the, the importance of it will, is hopefully, I mean, it's already diminishing and I think it's going to continue to diminish where you have to do it but there's so many other things that you, you, you can do. Oh yeah, I mean it, that exists already. I mean the fact that I, I look at when people make announcements now, you know, look at the presidential election. I mean, mm -hmm. People announce things on Twitter, but you know, that that's that's the means of getting your message out there even quicker than what a press release yeah. used to do. You know, it's shorter, it's less complete of a message, but it's a way of getting that information out in front mm -hmm. of people. You, you brought up Mylan, which I thought was a really interesting, um, timely topic to bring up because it, it just did an interview with KDK Radio on Friday, and, okay. and they asked, or last week, um, and they asked me, you know, what uh, my thoughts were on the Ryan Lochte apology, mm -hmm. the Donald Trump apology, um, and those things. He that actually didn't apologize. For I thought he well, didn't apologize. It was framed as an apology. It was a it was a, a mea culpa, I guess, yeah. if if you want to frame it that way. But um, you know, and and I. I thought was interesting about it was that it was so legalized. It was the the, the Lochte one especially. Oh, yeah. Thirteen people probably looked at that and wrote it. Yeah. And, and what and a little quick card change. <laughs> After ten minutes, someone needs to buy a new memory card. It's not Steve. Um, so we were just talking about Jonah Hill's apology yeah. on the Fallon show from a couple years ago. 
what, what I what I really liked about his as compared to a, a Lochte or a Trump that is is the very kind of formalized legal um, apology is, is it was just him. Um, he came on and you know it was a controlled environment. It was him and Fallon and they had a conversation I'm sure beforehand of what he was going to say and what he wasn't going to do. Um, but it came through as, as wholly authentic and, and you know Google it on YouTube and, and check it out. But three or four minutes long. Um, and he talked about why it, it hurt him to, to hear himself say it, to watch the video. Um, you can see, I mean, at, at points he was he was trembling because it, it, it bothered him so much. Oh, yeah. You can see the, the feeling come across. And, and I think that's what people expect now, is, is if you're actually sorry about it, I want to see that you're sorry about it. Well, it's the exact same thing that we talk about like with social media. People want authenticity. Mm -hmm. They don't, I mean, it's the same reason that there's a million social influencers and people prefer watching people vlogging versus some fake television. It's why people, I think, originally gravitated to reality TV mm -hmm. before it became something that's even more contrived, great, yeah, yeah. More contrived than fiction. <laughs> but like, people craved authenticity, and I think people d realize that now. Nobody cares about you know, the canned statement, mm -hmm. which is, I don't think it's a worry for PR professionals. I think it's an opportunity for PR professionals. Is you need to get better at at, at coming up with something that's real and authentic and putting, you know, helping your client or helping someone that you're dealing with through a, a tough situation where you need to help them, guide them from a communication standpoint. How can you actually do that that comes off real and authentic? Right. One is they have to probably feel that way. You can't just apologize for the sake of apologizing. It, it comes off that way. Yeah. I, think, I think that's probably a good thing for society as opposed to just our profession. Right. You know, there's, you know, you have to realize that people will forgive mistakes. I mean, if you look out there, you know, look at look at Michael Phelps is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. You're talking about guy had two DUIs. Oh, he people hated him. Two DUIs got in trouble for weed. People hated him, and we're sitting here talking about him as an American hero because I think in a lot of ways his apologies made him seem real, mm -hmm. made him seem accessible. He, you know, he talked about human. depression. He talked about how he had no relationship with his father. And he was open about it and said, yeah, I screwed things up. Mm -hmm. You know, it also helped him win 23 gold medals. People, yeah. people like a winner, but still, you know, there was there was a human side to it that I think people really appreciated. What I, uh, there's an article that I've, I've had in draft for yeah, three months now, but uh, PR Week did a, um, a piece on Trump and how they were asking if, if this meant the death of authenticity. You know, on social media, we start talking about authenticity mm -hmm. and... And you know, you, the, the the crux of the article was that Trump was able to go and succeed despite of, of him, you know, being who he is and, and you know having all of the character flaws that, that you know he has. And and I think that I argued in, in the comments portion of the article. I said it's actually proving the opposite point of view. It's proving the power of authenticity even more in that he can be whatever whatever you think of him. You know, if you think he's terrible or if you think he's great. It almost doesn't matter because he was being himself, and that's what people liked. So it wasn't so much that they, they like his position on X, Y, or Z, in as much as that they're like, he tells it like it is, he's not putting that veil on. Yeah. It's the same reason Tiger Woods had such a tr uh, problem, because that cognitive dissonance that takes place between the cultivated brand mm -hmm. and who you really are. It's interesting that you bring up Tiger Woods, because I want to talk about another athlete that, 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 that when you're talking about authenticity. And I think you're right, Trump. Trump Trump's an interesting character because half of it's wondering if he's saying these things just to get to get elected mm -hmm. or if he really believes them and that, that's a great debate and it's not really one that I want to talk about because yeah. everybody has their own opinion on it we but need many, we many, need more, many beers. more beers and a lot more memory <laughs> card space to cover that but um, is Michael Jordan Michael yeah. Jordan came out about a month ago and said some things about um, about the state of relations between blacks and the police department mm -hmm. uh, across the country. And Michael Jordan was someone who was so guarded and never, ever came out and said anything but uh, politically. And he's he's famous for the quote, you guys, you know the thing about Republicans? They buy sneakers too. <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. Because somebody said that he should run for you know the Democratic yeah. seat. And, and he didn't and want to get involved. Yeah, the thing about Republicans, they buy sneakers mm -hmm. too. So he never wanted to get involved with that. And his statement came out, and it was a wasn't a particularly powerful statement, at least in my estimation, but the fact it was from somebody that never took that step before gave it so much more right. gravitas. It was like, you know, granted he's Michael Jordan, he's a, you know, he's the Mount, you know, 
Mount Rushmore of, of, of pop culture and sports icons yeah. here in, in America. But like it gave this huge, huge resonance to his words because he hadn't taken that step before. Well, and you, you compare that with someone like a Charles Barkley, mm. you know, who's out there saying stuff all the time, and he can get away with saying so much more because he says it all the time that you know he gets chalked up to that's Charles being Charles, Charles you know, Charles, and, and yeah. everyone's just like, oh, I love him for it, whether you agree with him or not. It's like I can respect him, mm -hmm. and that's what you know, Tiger, Michael Jordan, you know, the, those athletes that have the the very carefully cultivated image is. It's great if you stay on image all the time, but once you start deviating from that, that's when you run into a heck of a lot of trouble. And well, I think the same is true for brands. Yeah, it, it's so. Yeah, it's really interesting, and, and we kind of got on this a athlete country. Just last week was Colin Kaepernick yeah. refusing to stand up for the um, Star Spangled Banner. Um, well, it, 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 coincidentally, right along the, the times when he refuses to stand up during games because he's on the bench. So yeah, coincidentally. Coincidentally, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, here nor there. But the interesting thing about it is, so I was listening to talk radio today, and obviously a lot of people were voicing very strong opinions you know, about it, yeah. both on both sides of it. And one of the things I thought was really, really interesting is, you know, Muhammad Ali just passed away five months ago. Not even five months ago, three months ago. And... People were so, you know, looked at him as this American hero and icon. They forget about they the forget about the 60s. fact that the, the '60s. <laughs> I mean, this is a guy who had the heavyweight title stripped from him yeah. because he refused to serve. He refused to report after he was drafted. Like, th to me, it's like this interesting space that exists. That like everybody says this is so outlandish and you know it's so disrespectful. Well, it's a it's a first um, a first amendment issue, and, and everybody's entitled to their own opinion on it. Now, I don't want to you know get into that part of it. But it's really interesting to see when an athlete who's a backup quarterback mm -hmm. can have that much power over, you know, it's dominated media airways for the last three days because of that, because it's something real and authentic. It's something different as opposed to the contrived, you know, you know, I, I was thinking back to the, of him walking in with his Beats headphones yeah. ads, and I'm thinking, I'm like, it's the same ad as Kevin Gar uh, Garnett, it's the same ad mm -hmm. as like three other people. And like this is something real and more authentic as to actually who he is. Right. Like him or love him, or li like him or hate him, you know. He took a stand. He took a stand, and that's that's much more interesting than we get most of the time. I think that I've, I've said this for years. I think there's a lot that brands can learn from athletes that have learned that and embraced it. Mm -hmm. I think you look at you know at the, some of the best athletes, best some of the best athletes on social. You know, when you look at what they're doing, you look at uh, Paul Bissonnette, mm -hmm. um, for example, or Brandon McCarthy. Um, these guys aren't superstars. They're not the LeBron James of the world. They have uh -huh. millions of followers. Why? Because they're just who they are. They, they share the, the, the slices of life. They let you know that, you know, yeah, they sit and get sucked into four-hour games of Madden with their buddies. They, yep. um, you know, they, they, they fall and stub their toe. They, they do stupid things. Their wife yells at them for not picking up their clothes. And, and you get that, that insight. And they're not afraid to, they, they've embraced that brand. And I think that's what brands that have, have done that have learned the power of that. And mm -hmm. I think more and more need to start doing that. Like I, I've said this for a long time. My, one of my favorite PR moves that a, that, a, that a brand has ever done, and it was something that was a little bit aggressive. Do you remember probably, it was probably six years ago, when there was a Harvard professor, who, a black Harvard professor who was sneaking, he was getting back into his house, he was locked out and a police officer approached him, and there was a whole, a whole big thing, and Obama had a beer summit okay. at the White House with this black Harvard professor and this white police officer, and it was like a talk about race relations and everything, and they were having a beer summit, and the White House, you know, it was like five days prior, they announced, yeah, they're gonna be drinking, you know, Bud, they're gonna have a yeah. Budweiser, and that. so Samuel Adams came out and said, we think you should drink Samuel Adams in this, because one, Budweiser is not an American, company mm -hmm. and it was this really like smart savvy move they came out again like you know if, if you're gonna have a talk about a marriage like, go with Sam go with Adam. Yeah. and it was like such an interesting thing because 99% of the time you see brands step away from anything controversial mm -hmm. and this was like a, a, a issue that has exploded over the last six years or you know realistically over the last 60 70 100 years race relations in the police department and they were willing to step into that, and not in a we're selling it way, but in a in a way of selling an attribute of their brand, which is we're American. So you're we're an American-owned company, as opposed to Inabev owning Anheuser Busch. We'll go back to to what you said about uh, Jordan and and Republican buy sneakers too. That's that's totally flipped, and it's it's better to say, you know what, 
Yeah, they do too, but I'd, I'd rather forego the, you know, X percent of, of people that will hear what I have to have that conversation. All right, one last card change before we finish this beer. <laughs> we promise we'll start drinking a little bit faster. So we were talking about how you actually talk to a client who who wants that result but is afraid to ruffle those feathers. Yeah. I think it's you know, there's two things at play. One is the role of the PR person I think has changed and, and I think that's where my role as, as a, a director of PR has really changed is that we've gone from being order takers and, and you know write this press release, tell our story, help us kind of craft that story and we're still doing a little bit of that but we're doing much much more kind of uh, cons image consulting, reputation management, a lot of these sorts of discussions and, and being paid to have that discussion with the board with the, the the client to say listen I know you want to go and do that initiative you don't have the creds to do that initiative you have to start acting that way first before you can start getting credit for it you can't just launch in and, and say well we donated a million dollars to um, you know this veterans organization and say well we support veterans you've, you've got to build it up over time and so I think that's where a lot of our roles come into play where I like to say um, I, I, you know, when I'm doing interviews, back to our, our initial people um, hiring discussion, if I'm hiring you, I, I often say, you know, you're going to have to serve, not maybe not this year, but as you grow, as kind of the head bullshit caller on, you know, clients and, and be able to have that voice. And you need to be, get to a level where you're comfortable enough to have that voice with, with me, with your clients, with everyone. Um, and then I think the second role of that is that, that for the brands, that's forcing more brands who... The CMO used to call those shots, mm -hmm. um, and the CMO is only around for what is it, two years now? Is the average time? It's like nine months. It just keeps getting right shorter. Right? Every every time I have one of these conversations, it keeps getting shorter. Yeah. So by the time you watch this, it'll be like nine months. It'll be um, nine. It'll be as long as we have on a memory. Yeah. <laughs> so, but and and if you give those decisions to those guys, of course they're going to say, "Well, we're not going to go take a stand because you might show not fruits of you might not show fruits of that labor until two years down the line." You have to play safe. You have to get your point one percent increase. Right. And, and because you want to keep your job, whereas I think the best brands, the ones we've named, the CEO is taking more and more of a role in the public image of the company mm -hmm. and how that that image is crafted and what's marketed and those decisions that lead to that. And the CEO, I mean, they can make those calls a lot easier than the CMO can. Yeah. I mean, they, they have more flexibility there. They're the, the CEO is the hardest person to fire. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, that's, yeah. I mean... You know, sometimes there's more movement up there at the top, but it's still, it's 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 a position. If you're going to make a change, it's, it affects the entire. Company. Yeah. Um, all right, Steve. So, what do we think of the beer? I think it's okay. Would have been better a little colder and a little colder day too. A little colder, but uh, little colder. not bad. I'm not I'm not usually a big stout fan, but this was this was pretty drinkable. Yeah, I liked it. There wasn't. I mean, it's it's a definite stout beer, but there's no it. There's a nice sort of coffee taste to it mm -hmm. that I like a lot. It's like a brown ale slash stout. Mix. Yes, it's it's a it's a good mixture of it. Yeah, and brown ales. Are, if anybody watches this and pays attention, and if you do pay attention to the beer that I mentioned, <laughs> good for I, you. Good for you. Yeah, there's a qu there's a quiz after episode 37. Um, but brown ales are one of my favorites, and you're right. There is a nice sort of it's like a coffee brown ale. Mm -hmm. is how I would describe yeah. it. so it's good. I would give it a thumbs up. I would like it a little bit colder, and I would like it on a non 95 degree <laughs> yeah. day. But you know, beggars can't be choosers. So, all right, we'll see. Hey, it's a beer at the end of the day, which means I'll take it. Yeah, well, it's funny. The last couple episodes I've filmed have been in the morning. Like oh, I, did, yeah. I did one where I like filmed it at 10:30 in the morning. So it's morning like, drinking. We had we had a, we had a straw beer, and we decided that was great morning yeah. beer. It's very refreshing. No preservatives, no hangover. Mm -hmm. by, by noon, I felt like I hadn't had a drink. I felt refreshed. <laughs> so this is a little different. So this is a great end of beer, end of beer day. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for being on, Thanks. Steve. I really Anytime. appreciate it. Uh, be sure to watch again next week. I'll have another guest, another beer, another episode. Thanks. And another memory card. And definitely <laughs> another memory card with a lot more space. So. Thanks for watching.